Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Lauren Wenzel. I'm with NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Center, and we're very pleased to be hosting this uh, webinar today with our colleagues at OCTO and Open Channels on the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change's special report on oceans and cryosphere. We have with us today several uh, scientists who were involved in putting that report together and contributing to it. And you're gonna be hearing directly from them about that report. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them and turn it over to them in just a moment. But I just want to remind you all that after the presentations, we will have plenty of time for questions and answers. So I encourage you to use the question box or the chat box to ask your questions or make your comments. And we will do our best to get to those after the presentations. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Um, first, we have Co Barrett, who is the vice chair um, of IPCC. Co Barrett currently serves as one of the three vice chairs of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the international body created to review and assess the scientific, technical, and socioeconomic information produced worldwide that is relevant to understanding climate change. Co is also the deputy assistant administrator for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Office for Oceanic and Atmospheric Research. Mm -hmm. Prior to her current role, Ms. Barrett represented the United States on many delegations dealing with climate change and sustainable development and led the climate change program at the United States Agency for International Development. She's widely recognized as an expert on climate policy, particularly on issues related to climate impacts and strategies to help society adapt to a changing world. Ms. Barrett has a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Studies and an Honorary Doctor of Science from the University of North Carolina, Asheville. Uh, next, we will hear from Dr. Ann Hollowood. Uh, she is a senior scientist with the NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center. She conducts research on the effects of climate and ecosystem change on the current and future status of fish and fisheries. And she leads the Status of Stocks and Multi-Species Assessment Program. Ann currently serves as the co-chair of the North Pacific Fishery Management Council's Scientific and Statistical Committee. And she is an affiliate professor with the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences at the University of Washington. We also have Dr. Shallon Bush. She is a research ecologist at the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program and the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Her research focuses on understanding species and ecosystem sensitivity to future ocean conditions with an emphasis on ocean acidification. Her programmatic work focuses on the interface of ocean acidification science, strategic planning, and policy from local to national levels. Shallon served as the US on the US delegation to the special report on oceans and cryosphere clearance meeting. And our last speaker is William Sweet. He is a senior oceanographer with NOAA's National Ocean Service, and he is leading NOAA's effort to track changes in sea level and coastal high tide flood risk along US coastlines, and is developing annual to decadal projections of both to help communities prepare and plan accordingly. And he was an author of, for the fourth National Climate Assessment and a member of DOD's Coastal Assessment Regional Scenario Working Group. So welcome to all of our speakers. And I will turn first to Co Barrett and ask you to, to take us through this. Thanks. Well, hey, everybody. Um, at whatever time zone you're in, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, so it's my job to just kick off the presentation with a very brief overview of uh, what the IPCC is, and a little bit of background about um, the activities that we are uh, undertaking in this assessment cycle. So next slide, please. Um, so um, the IPCC, which has been around for just over 30 years, is really the preeminent um, body for issues of climate. And its mandate is to assess comprehensively um, the scientific, technical, and socioeconomic aspects of uh, climate change. It's uh, the physical science, the risks, the impacts, the adaptation, ways to adapt, and ways to mitigate. And the organization is uh, very, very attentive to the need to present this information in an accessible way that is policy neutral, um, even though we do project. Uh, we do uh, share and assess information on options that folks can take to um, 
address climate issues. Next slide. So, so the way that IPCC works, which is really, um, it's really unique, is um, it's kind of got various handshakes along the way as it produces its assessment, assessment reports between science, scientists and governments. That's the intergovernmental part of the IPCC. So generally, um, the, the government delegations will get together and um, approve the outlines for the assessment reports that we will undertake in, in our six to seven year cycles. Um, the outlines will be scoped by scientists, but agreed by the governments. And then at very, various stages along the way, um, as we're developing these reports, science, the governments have a chance to kind of come back in to have their views reflected through comments on drafts. And then at the end of this, what is basically a two to three year process, um, the final report is presented to governments in a plenary session. And the summary that is drafted for policymakers is negotiated by governments line by line, word by word. And now the scientists are there at these approval sessions and Shalin and Billy um, were, were there um, as part of a, the US delegation and who you'll hear from shortly was an author. Um, scientists are present to make sure that the changes that governments may ask for are still scientifically robust. But in the end, the report is accepted by over um, 150 governments worldwide. And that I think is part of what makes this um, these reports so robust and so quoted around the world. So uh, next slide. So during this assessment cycle, the IPCC is producing its standard suite of four main assessment reports that cover the physical science, adaptation and impacts and vulnerability, as well as mitigation issues and a synthesis report. But we always produce a couple of special reports at the beginning of our assessment cycles in order to address some topical areas that seem to be um, of interest to policymakers. So this assessment cycle, we produced three special reports that are pictured here. Um, and together with the main assessment report, um, um, this marks the most intensive and ambitious period in the IPCC's 30 year history. We've never undertaken seven reports, plus we have a methodology report. So eight reports um, in our six to seven year cycle. And we're in the sixth, um, sixth cycle. Um, and it really stretched us and will probably attest to that as she speaks. But, um, but these three special reports, so, uh, Um, have built a strong foundation for the main reports that will be released in the coming years. By the, so the, the first report of one point was requested by the, um, sorry, I'm getting some feedback, um, was requested by the Paris Agreement, and it talks about what would happen if we were able to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, the advantages and also the pathways it would take to get there. The second report that we delivered was on all things climate and land and looked at issues like desertification, land degradation, sustainable land management, food security, et cetera. Um, and then the last report that we delivered, special report that we delivered in September is um, the special report on oceans and cryosphere and a changing climate. And this is the report that we'll focus on today. Next slide, please. So this report is unique because for the first time, the IPCC has produced an in-depth report examining the farthest corners of the earth from the highest mountains and remote polar regions to the deepest oceans. And we found that even and especially in these places, human-caused climate change is evident. The report documents such things as the melting of high mountain glaciers and polar ice sheets, which contain the freshwater for our future. It documents the thawing of permafrost, which is the frozen foundation for communities and wildlife habitats of the North. 
It shines a light on coastal and low-lying areas where sea level rise and associated impacts threaten the lives and livelihoods of large segments of the population. And it documents the ways in which for decades, the ocean has been acting like a sponge, absorbing carbon dioxide and heat to regulate the global temperature. But the report finds that these systems can't keep up with the cha challenges it's, they are receiving from climate change. So taken together, these changes show that the world's ocean and cryosphere have been taking the heat for climate change for decades. And the consequences for nature and humanity are sweeping and severe. And this report also highlights the urgency of timely, ambitious, coordinated, and enduring action. What's at, li what's at stake is the health of ecosystems, wildlife, and importantly, the world that we leave our children. And we're going to spend the rest of our time now kind of digging in to this report. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anne. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, whatever time zone you're in. Um, it's my pleasure to um, uh, pick up where Cole left off. Uh, as she mentioned, uh, the focus of this report was on the cryosphere and the um, ocean uh, and here the cryosphere are the uh, components of the earth system at and below the land and ocean surface that are frozen and so this includes snow glaciers ice sheets sea ice and the integral role they have in um, in influencing the ocean next slide please The, uh, the report really picks up where we left off in terms of the uh, AR5. Uh, th that report embraced the piece that, uh, that not only is, this, is the Earth system influenced by climate, but also by the actions that society has on it. And so our assessment uh, endeavored to try and bring together physical scientists, bio biologists, as well as uh, uh, socio uh, economists and uh, social scientists. And the idea here was to assess the overall risk of changing climate under different socioeconomic responses, as well as different carbon emission scenarios. And so what we were really looking at is the overall link between vulnerability, the extreme hazards, and you'll hear a little bit of this from what Shallon's talking about, and certainly William will talk about the hazards of sea level rise and the relative exposure in different parts of the world to changing climate. Next slide, please. So my talk is going to focus on the polar regions. Uh, I, I will say up front that that we talk that while the report dealt deals with the Arctic and the Antarctic and the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean, uh, the most of my talk will deal with the ocean aspects of the polar chapter and with a specific emphasis on the Arctic region. Next slide, please. So you're going to see three slides now. I want to just orient you. These are all from chapter three. Uh, the top panel deals with the observed changes that we've seen. So uh, what we're dealing with here is, uh, in this case, Arctic sea ice trends. Uh, the colors are the percent change per decade and here we were looking at the period from 1982 to 2017. And you can see that uh, in the case of September sea ice, we're seeing about a 12.8% uh, decline in sea ice extent. That's not uh, universally uh, the same across the Arctic. The stippled areas are where there has been an insignificant change. Uh, the darker areas, of course, as you can see, are are located along the Eurasian Shelf and in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. But it should be pointed out that sea ice has thinned and reduced in all months, not just September. And these changes are likely unprecedented for at least the last 
1,000 years. Next slide, please. So now I want you, same, slide, same figure, but now I want you to look at the lower panel. And here what we're looking at are the projected changes over time. And the different uh, colors of those lines are under a high emission scenario, the red line. Uh, you can see that we're, we are looking at an ice-free Arctic in September towards the end of the century, whereas if we curb emissions, a lower emission scenario, in this case this is representative concentration pathway 2.6, this is roughly a, the scenario that would have as a two and three chance of limiting global warming to below two degrees C, so it could even go further as was noted by Co. there's a 1.5 degree target, so this blue line is a less than two degree target. Uh, and sea ice is projected to continue the decline. Uh, what we're going to be seeing is that, that the uh, severity of that sea ice decline depends on what emission scenario we end up on. Uh, next slide, please. This is the same plot, and now I'm going to talk about both the observed changes and the projected changes on the same slide. This is sea surface temperature, and as you can imagine, associated with loss of sea ice, we're seeing uh, warming at the surface in the across the Arctic. You can see the intensity of that. Uh, uh, there is again along the Eurasian Shelf, and in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. Uh, sea surface temperatures have already warmed at about half a degree per decade during that period, 82 to 17. Uh, is particularly influenced by the inflowing waters from the Atlantic and Pacific that are bringing more heat into the Arctic and uh, future scenarios. Again, you can imagine this: the, the direction of change is reversed here on the lower panel with the red line being the warming and the blue line being uh, this emission where the, the lower emission scenario. I should note that the black line here is the actual observed and you can see that right now we're trending to be on the upper end of the uncertainty bars here, the sort of gray stippled areas around uh, the projections. Next slide, please. So what does this mean for boreal systems? Uh, uh, the, what we're seeing is a real change in the habitat. Uh, the uh, Barents Sea and the Bering Sea are, are, are the entrance to the Arctic, and, and uh, what we're seeing is a contraction of the Arctic uh, habitat and the expansion of the habitat for boreal systems. So we're seeing a retreat in, say, Arctic cod and an expansion of the range of Atlantic cod. Next slide, please. Yeah. Now, these sorts of uh, issues, uh, it's uh, they're compounded across not only a few species, but across the entire socio-ecological system that's there. We're seeing increased tourism as that shipping lanes open up with the retreat of sea ice. We're seeing uh, tourism and shipping happening more in that region. This is affecting local and indigenous peoples and their ability to fish at the timing of their fisheries as well as how they fish. And we're seeing implications on many of the um, biological uh, systems and, and uh, species that live in that region. Next slide, please. The report uh, ends in a quite interesting piece, and I encourage you all to look at it. Uh, it. It recognizes that people living in the Arctic, especially indigenous people, are already adjusting their travel and hunting activities to the seasonality and safety of land, ice, and snow conditions. And uh, it then looks at the potential pathways that humans have in terms of look, uh, building resilience to the expected changes. And these uh, really are going to rely on actionable science. And it's a really call for all of us that are on the science side of the house to bring forward integrated uh, act research activities like what is happening within the IPCC forum 
to try and inform stakeholders of the scenarios that they can plan that might help them to address the implications of a changing climate. And the lower panels here are an example that we have uh, in the Bering Sea, where we are doing just that. We're downscaling uh, global climate projections to a regional ocean model, and then using those scenarios to try and look at adaptive pathways, in this case of fisheries management, to uh, the expected changes that are coming forward. And this is all being brought forward to the public through a fisheries ecosystem plan. And uh, so then next slide, please. So my take homes uh, from, from the polar chapter is that the climate has been being uh, impacted with global consequences. And uh, the, the, you can see that across many aspects, the polar ocean of the future will will appear significantly different than from those of today. And the choices, I think the key point here is the choices are available that will influence the nature and magnitude of these changes. And the report goes into those in detail. And that's it. So I no, will, speaker is Shallon Bush and she will walk you through the uh, projected impacts on the ocean and marine life. Thanks, Anne, and uh, thanks for giving that presentation. I always learn so much when I listen to talks from you. Uh, so I'm an ecologist, so I'm going to talk about ocean change through the lens of um, thinking about things as fish habitat, mammal habitat, and, and really habitat for people. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about ocean ecosystems writ large and some of the really bigger patterns that we're seeing in the Earth systems in the ocean, and then also kind of drilling down into some examples in, in the place that I focus my research on, which is the California current ecosystem on the west coast of the U.S. Um, so getting back to these really big pictures, so to date, the ocean has taken up more than 90 percent of the excess heat in the climate system. By the year 2100, the ocean will take up two to four times more heat if global warming is limited to two degrees Celsius and up to five to seven times more heat at higher emissions. So next slide, please. I'll show you this in graphical form and I'm gonna show you a series of these uh, images so I'll, I'll walk you through it. On the x-axis of all these images, we have time in years. On the left panel, we have Celsius, uh, degrees Celsius, and on the right panel, the y-axis is joules, which is a measurement of energy. Uh, what you can see in the different colors in the traces is that we have two ways to look at historical information of what was going on in the ocean. In the purple, which you can see on the right-hand panel, um, that's observed data that we have from the oceans. Uh, in the kind of sand color, those are uh, historical conditions as output by models. So this gives us a sense of where we were in the past and how change has happened from the past to the modern day, and then looking out into the future. So Anne talked about two different projection pathways for emissions, RCP 8.5, which is a high emission pathway, and RCP 2.6, which is a low emission pathway. 8.5 is always shown in red, and 2.6 always in blue. So what you can see in the top left panel is the change in Celsius of the global mean surface air temperature. So what you see is a marching up over time exacerbated by this higher emission scenario. The panel below that is sea surface temperature where you see a paralleling of those trends in the atmosphere. Um, with under the 2.5 or sorry 2.6 scenario you see kind of a leveling off after the year about 2050. Um, so where is all the ocean, the heat in the ocean going? Well, it's invading into the ocean's depths. And that's what's portrayed in the image on the right, where we're showing the ocean heat content from the surface at zero meters down to 2,000 meters. And what you can see is, which is different pattern under 2.6, the emission pathway, is that the heat in the ocean will continue to rise, even though heat in the surface uh, levels off at 2050. And this heat content is part of what will drive um, the information that Billy will talk about in, in sea level rise, this, this uh, gathering of heat in the oceans. Next slide, please. 
Uh, but what's been really interesting over the past 20 years is not this kind of long-term observation of the long-term press of warming in ocean systems, but pulses. Marine heat waves are becoming more frequent and severe, especially harming warm water corals, kelp forests, and the distribution of marine life. So the physical phenomenon and ecological implications. Next slide. So I'm going to just talk to you about this. I'm really focused on this because it was um, a really big finding of this report um, in terms of the science and the literature we have, and also a really important communication point um, out of the scientific community to, towards policymakers. So here in this image on the x-axis, again, you have year going back to year 1850 out to 2100. And on the y-axis, you have increase in the probability of marine heat waves. So how likely is it that a marine heat wave is going to happen? Uh, what you can see in the black line, which is observations, is kind of this uptick of marine heat waves that have happened over the last 30 some odd years. Uh, you can see historically modeled this, this change really only started happening in the 1990s in the way that we could detect it. Um, and what you can see in, in looking out to the future, RPC 2.6 has again a leveling off at about 20% increase in the probability of heat waves, and then 8.5 continues to increase to the year 2100 at the end of the century, landing at about uh, 50 to 60% increased probability of marine heat waves. So heat waves are projected to further increase in frequency, duration, spatial and extent and intensity, which we call here the, the maximum temperature. And this is a very high confidence finding. Limiting global warming would reduce the risk of impacts of marine heat waves, but critical thresholds for some ecosystems will be reached at relatively low levels of future warming. And that's a high confidence finding. So even under lower emission pathways, we could see some of the ecological implications of these, these pulse events, these marine heat waves. Next slide. So the distribution of heat waves, um, the probability of increase of heat waves is not evenly distributed around ocean ecosystems. What you can see under uh, the left panel is RCP 2.6, the right is 8.5, and this is the end of the century, the last 20 years of the century. Uh, warmer colors here are uh, more likely and the yellow is, is less likely. So what you see under both uh, emissions pathways is a real increase in probability in the lower line to the ecosystems and also up in the Arctic ecosystems that Anne focused on and a little bit in the, in the um, Southern Ocean. Next slide. So you're probably familiar with heat waves and the ecological implications discussed related to um, warm water tropical coral reef ecosystems. And so in the figure on the left is a probably a familiar figure of a bleached coral reef. And so here the coral polyps have expelled their zoxanthellae, these symbiotic algae that help produce energy and give them a lot of color. Uh, so they expel these al uh, algae. It doesn't mean they're dead, but not all corals will survive um, and persist through a bleaching event. Some will, but not all will. On the right shows you another image related to heat waves. So this is um, the years 2015 and 2016. And what this shows you is degree heating week. Um, so this is the cumulative amount of time that ocean ecosystems were above, um, I think it's one degree Celsius of their typical maximum mean. And what you can see, these were two really warm years and the dots are showing you bleaching. So purple dots are severe bleaching where more than 30% of our coral reef bleached. Moderate light purple uh, is where uh, less than 30% of the reef bleached and then the almost white is no substantial bleaching. So you can see throughout the, tro the tropical Pacific and Indian Oceans, a lot of severe bleaching and also some severe bleaching in the, in the Caribbean as well within those just two years. Uh, next slide, please. But what's really come to fore in the last 10 years is the impacts of marine heat waves on non-coral systems. And so these 10 examples here on the figure on the left are heat waves that have occurred in the past 20 or so years, mostly in the past 10 years that have occur occurred throughout the globe. The warmer the water is in the ocean, the, the greater the maximal extent intensity of the marine heat wave. Five of these 10 heat wave events um, have likely or very likely attribution of extreme temperatures to anthropogenic climate change. So we can see the signature of climate change on these. Uh, in all, all of these, we've also been able to observe impacts uh, of the heat wave on physical systems over land, marine ecosystems, or socioeconomic and human systems. 
Uh, on the right picture, the set of pictures, I show you some of the implications of the North Pacific blob heat wave that occurred in 2013 to 15. Uh, so we had changes in, in productivity in the system, which caused starvation of some marine mammals, uh, low returns of salmon. We had booms for species like pyrosomes and harmful algal blooms in the system due to the warming. Uh, we had kelp forests that were directly sensitive to the warming conditions, but ecological cascades that were triggered that have prevented these kelp forests from coming back. And then the image of a whale entangled by a fishing line um, in indicates another cascade of events where whales prey moved closer to shore due to the warming event. Harmful algal blooms rose, which delayed the opening of the crab fishery. So then you have the situation where the whales were going closer to shore to reach their prey, and the fishery was happening when the whales were there, causing a real increase in entanglement, which is a very unexpected effect. Next slide, please. So now I'll start moving on to um, non-warming impacts of climate change. By absorbing human-induced carbon emissions, the ocean is becoming more acidic. So carbon dioxide is an acid gas. When it dissolves in water, it breaks apart and forms carbonic acid. So the ocean has taken up 20 to 30 percent of carbon emissions and continued uptake will exacerbate acidification. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to show you what this looks like in terms of an image. So you can see over time through uh, direct observations of models and projections of the future, a real decline in pH of the oceans. Uh, to put this in perspective, pH is on a log scale. So by the year 2100, under RCP 8.5, ocean acidity, the concentration of hydrogen ions in the ocean, could increase by 100 to 150 percent. Uh, to put this into perspective, the rate of acidification, this rate of acidification is, is 10 to 100 times faster than any other ocean change in terms of acidification that's happened in the last 50 million years. Uh, so we can understand through laboratory and field studies to date that calcifying species seem to be most directly sensitive to changes in pH. So in terms of their, the ability for them to build their calcium carbonate shells and skeletons, and then also dissolution or, or maintain those uh, against dissolution from oceans onto their structures they've created. So we can see the foraminifera, which is the image in the middle, uh, the tests of those pelagic foraminifera that have been observed to decrease um, uh, sorry, I have an alarm going off. Uh, decrease over time as the oceans have acidified. Uh, we also see a dissolution of pteropod shells in more acidified environments, and there's a link between an increase in toxicity of harmful algal blooms under acidification conditions. Next slide, please. Ocean warming uh, reduces mixing between water layers and therefore the supply of oxygen and nutrients for marine life. So carbon dioxide and oxygen are tied together in the respiration processes, but um, respiration is, is inducing some of this uh, deoxygenation, but so is ocean warming. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? And what we can see again in a similar image up in the top left, uh, we can observe and model this decline of ocean historical conditions and project it out into the future. So ocean loss, like I said, is primarily due to ocean stratification, uh, changing ventilation and biogeochemistry. That's a high confidence finding. Decreases in oxygen levels have altered ecosystem structure with direct negative impacts on biomass production and species composition. So that's a medium impact finding. So the images down below show you some uh, observations from the California current ecosystem. We've had an increase in hypoxic events, low oxygen events um, off the coast of, of Oregon over the past decade or two. And we can see that in mass mortalities of Dungeness crab, both uh, existing in the wild and also uh, when fishermen pull up pots of dead crabs. We can also observe and model uh, compression of habitat for species like rockfish, which seem to be sensitive to the percent of oxygen in waters. And then like with acidification, harmful algal blooms uh, tend to be favored under low oxygen environments. Next slide. So to put this all together and kind of put it into a context of time, I show you this image related to time of emergence of key ocean condition variables. And so what this shows you is the percent of the ocean that is different than it was historically due 
to climate change. What you can see is that right now, the entire surface of uh, the ocean has a different pH than it had historically. 80% of the ocean now has a uh, different temperature, sea surface temperature, SST, than it did historically. And you can see this increase in the percent of the ocean uh, that's different in terms of oxygen, nitrate, and primary productivity. So this shows us how the ocean conditions are moving out of what they were historically into a new normal. Next slide, please. And these changes in the ocean cause shifts in fish populations. This has reduced the global catch potential. In the future, some regions will see further decreases, but there will be increases in others. So next slide, please. What the image on the left shows you is projected changes in risks for ocean ecosystems as a result of climate change expressed through primary productivity, animal biomass, and fisheries catch potential. The green images on the left show you where we are today, and then you have RCP 2.6 and 8.5 model projections. So what you can see in the purple colors is an increase and in the orange colors is a decrease. So what you see is an increase in primary productivity and polar ecosystems mirrored by an increase in biomass and then uh, maximum fisheries potential where fisheries are executed. But what you see through the majority of the low and mid latitude ecosystems is a decrease in productivity, a decrease in animal biomass, and then a decrease in maximum fisheries catch potential. So bringing this to humans, uh, communities that depend on high depend highly on seafood may face risk to nutritional health and food security. What we know is that reducing other pressures such as pollution will further help marine life deal with changes in their environment uh, caused by climate change. And that policy frameworks for fisheries management and marine protected areas offer opportunities for people to adapt to these changes. Um, so with that, I'll pass it to Billy, who's gonna focus on sea level rise. Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, all. Glad to be able to present to you uh, chapter four within the uh, report dealing with sea level rise and, and its impacts. Um, so I'll just get right to it. Um, what we're finding here essentially is that uh, during the 20th century, um, global mean sea level rose about 15 centimeters. Um, we know that now, currently, uh, the rates are about double that since about the early 1990s or so, so almost the last 30 years, above three millimeters a year or so. Uh, and that rate is likely to continue to accelerate under all the models. Um, looking at the likely range of uh, reduced uh, RCP 2.6 kind of scenario versus 8.5, the likely range, somewhere between 0.3 and 1.1 meters by the end of the century. Uh, possibly more, and it's all emission dependent. Uh, so the median values are more in the lines of about 0.4 to 0.8, but oftentimes decisions aren't made by the median. Um, it's really based on risk tolerance. So if you're in a situation where, uh, it, you know, if if it was higher and you had a lot to lose, then uh, planning, and that's what we'll, I'll mention here in a minute, NOAA, oftentimes we, we go above the, uh, uh, go to these low percentages of if it can happen, it might happen, what are the effects? Uh, we do know that extreme sea levels of all severities are becoming more impactful as coastal freeboard diminishes or the gap between our infrastructure and high tide closes with sea level rise. Uh, and the effects of this will be particularly uh, severe in many low-lying coastal cities and, and small islands, um, which in the was assessed within this report looking at in a probabilistic threshold, the 100-year flood uh, causing uh, supposedly causing flooding and erosion some places more than others uh, may very well become an annual basis by 2050 without uh, strong adaptation measures. Next slide please. Um, so there's a very good website uh, NASA sea level change team has a, a very a portal that sort of keeps track of the pulse of, of what I just said in terms of rates and its components. Uh, something that's important to recognize is that we know that um, Based on altimeter, we know that the two main components going into this three millimeter or slightly above rate uh, per year is about two parts melt, shown here in the blue on the right, uh, ocean mass increases from land-based ice melt, and about one third thermal expansion, water warms it expands. Uh, not exactly that ratio, but close. Uh, land water storage on land, uh, 
has some effect, but it's it's minor compared to these other two. And what's important to know is the ocean mass components picking up, and that's the wild card towards the end of the century. Next slide, please. The impacts are here now, and I think that's the important thing to stress. It's not an end of the century uh, discussion. Sea level rise uh, is causing high tide flooding across the United States. Um, I work for NOAA, the group that runs all the tide gauges. We monitor and we measure it, uh, and we compare it to what the National Weather Service used to assess floods. And sunny day flooding, nuisance flooding is, is on the uptick. And in fact, it's accelerating in over 40 locations around our country. Uh, and the median rate is it continues to climb uh, with, with increasing sea level. And that's shown on, on the left. So it's something we're keeping track of. But uh, the term stationarity is, is dead. <laughs> the statistics that a lot of our infrastructure, uh, infrastructure was built to is no longer valid. We're flooding when we used to not flood. Next slide, please. Um, and so really your exposure uh, at any location is, is really uh, pretty complex. It has, you know, what are the processes affecting mean sea level? And here's a, a, a very complicated schematic that, though that gives some very good insights as to, you know, global, regional and local processes that will affect a particular location. And in this case, we have sort of the global processes, then we have of subsidence and groundwater and a lot of human uh, management uh, practices that affect local uh, subsidence, let's say. But as we also have the melt of the ice sheets, uh, the warming, we have circulatory factors. And then what's most important is really your extremes, you know, tides, storms, what kind of exposure do you have? Not just mean sea level, but how's that change of mean sea level really manifested in terms of the events that are caused the problems? Are they particular high tides or are you in a stormy area like we are on the East Coast when the winds blow, water set up a couple feet, 0.3 meters or so is fairly typical with a 15, 20 knot breeze. Whereas if you're on an island with a very narrow continental shelf, uh, it, you just don't set water up as high. So you don't have as much variability. And that also has an important ramification for how development has occurred. Uh, where there is a lot of extreme, you're used to it and you, you uh, build in the correct buffers, but when water does it very much, you're not used to this, uh, the surprises may come, and that's sort of, uh, we'll get to that in a few slides. Next slide, please. So in terms of projections, what's new uh, relative to the last IPCC report is basically some contribution from the Antarctic ice sheet itself has increased the higher emission scenarios up uh, 10 to 15 centimeters or so. So basically at 2100, uh, where the median values under the RCP 2.6 up to the 8.5 is somewhere between a 0.4 and 0.8. Uh, the likely estimates of that are sort of go down to the 0.3, the low end for the RCP 2.6, basically a continuation of the current rate now, up to a 1.1 meter by 2100. Um, and what's shown here, though, is really when you get out to 2200, 2300, uh, the uncertainties grow and so do the magnitudes. So uh, it definitely uh, emission dependent and sea levels on a trajectory uh, that's very likely to continue to grow for centuries to come. Just how much again is, is related back to these emissions. What isn't necessarily shown here are the things like the 1% chance outcomes. Again, sometimes that rolling of the dice, you know, the one in a hundred, uh, it very unlikely, but if it does occur, you know, that type of assessment is not necessarily strictly quantified in these types of plots. Next slide, please. Um, so some of that uncertainty with ice sheet uh, instabilities, the dynamical instabilities, the uh, ice cliff instabilities, some of these uh, processes that aren't very well characterized in the models, uh, at least not parameterized well enough to uh, capture the, the deep uncertainties, let's say, that, that do exist. So this is still ongoing, but here's just a, a schematic of what of, of the Thwaites Glacier. Uh, and Antarctica sort of showing some of the uh, processes that do affect these uh, terminating glaciers that uh, go right into the ocean. Um, basically with this sort of reverse slope retrograde bedrock, uh, as the melting goes from underneath and you have a retreat, uh, basically the sea level is, the water is, is underpinning it. And so as it retreats, it begins to float, and if it thins enough, you start getting these dynamical instabilities, which will cause it to break up 
Um, but again, the quantification of that is difficult. The ice cliff instability is basically the same thing as you thin, you start to get larger ice cliffs that eventually become unstable in themselves, the weight of the ice, and they will start to break. Um, so these uncertainties aren't very well captured. Um, it's still ongoing, but would definitely lend to the deep uncertainty in the, in, for risk quantification purposes, the higher amounts of sea level rise that are plausible, but yet are hard to assess in terms of uh, quantification that was done here um, as well as in the past. So those probabilistic assessments do exist and oftentimes they rely more on expert elicitation in terms of the processes at play that aren't necessarily characterizing the models. Next slide, please. Uh, future sea level rise will not be uniform. It's not like water in the bathtub. Three main factors are uh, thermal expansion and dynamical effect circulation. Uh, other sort of these fingerprinting of uh, gravitational deformation of uh, due to redistribution of land ice. Uh, and third is, is is modeled here is uh, is a isostatic adjustment due to the last uh, major glaciers that were there. And so all three of these will um, help uh, determine whether or not you're above or below the global average. And so looking at the U.S. for the most part. Uh, higher than average, at least at the higher uh, emission scenarios, largely due to deformation in Antarctica, as well as GIA effects going on in the northern latitudes, and it's sort of a, a combination of the three in an integrative kind of sense. Next slide, please. So the consequences of increase in sea level is really uh, an increased frequency of extremes. So what, what they showed here is basically as a rule of thumb, let's use the one annual 1% chance event, or they call it here the historical centennial extreme event. The 100 year event is loosely termed. You know, what is that currently? Uh, and then how is that likely to change into these two uh, trajectories of sea level that they have shown? And they get this amplification factor. Uh, at least what they show here is once the 100 years sort of become the annual scale event. Uh, and what you typically see is you're more likely to become an annual scale with less sea level rise where there's not that much difference, as much difference between your 100 year and your one year, areas where you don't have extreme variability. Um, so one could argue that the 100 year event isn't overly impacting right now. For instance, in Honolulu, the 100, 100 year event may or may not actually cause noticeable flooding. And this is the tide gauge assessment, not really including waves. But nonetheless, it gives you a sense of exposure. And these are the types of events that traditionally cause uh, certain types of impacts, and they are expected to increase in frequency uh, and likely increase exposure uh, and overall vulnerability within today's society. Next slide, please. And so with that, they examine several different uh, areas and geographies around the world and trying to look at sort of what is the capacity to respond to sea level rise based upon a whole host of factors. And again, we don't really have time to, to walk through all these, but essentially what you see is there are communities that are just, no matter how much uh, response is, is put into it, their risk is gonna in, uh, main, be basically elevated. And those are these areas in the Arctic, some of these urban uh, toll islands where they just do a lot of times the geophysical and the geography of the, uh, of the area are just not going to fully be able to respond. And hence this idea of a sort of a, a managed um, uh, uh, retreat or, or you know, relocation, let's say, is definitely something to uh, be thought of and that is actually sort of ongoing currently or at least being discussed. Whereas these other resource rich communities that, uh, are able to respond and build and protect, uh, they have the capacity to do so. And so it sort of is an interplay between the physical exposure and the societal socioeconomic uh, capacity to respond. Next slide, please. So two last slides as we're bringing this back home to NOAA, uh, we have our own sea level rise scenarios, which this intermediate low and intermediate one half meter and one meter global rise by the end of the century are pretty well aligned with the, what they are uh, sort of the, for the risk framing purposes, what's being shown here in the uh, in this report, uh, and what we show here is a uh, actual sea level rise relative to these two as it's manifest locally with these other localization uh, causing the area in Miami to be slightly different than the global average. And how well is it tracking? Uh, sort of what trajectory are we on, and what is the ramification of this rise? Next slide, please. We're actually producing uh, 
products and services at NOAA that uh, map areas of high tide exposure, you know, what we're calling the high tide flood threshold. Uh, we're also giving next year outlooks as well as 2030 and 2050 binned by these two uh, half meter global and one meter global. What is that likely to mean in terms of, of high tide flooding events per year? And so we already have flooding issues in Charleston, Norfolk, Miami, a host of cities and communities are really starting to ask for next year uh, numbers for planning, uh, for budgeting, as well as decades to come so that they can you know, correctly identify uh, the solution that's best for their local uh, localities in response to this increasing risk. Uh, so with that, uh, I, will, I will close and, and pass it back over. All right, this is Lauren Wenzel. Thank you all so much. That was just an amazing overview and so much information that you all provided in a very um, compact form. So I'd like to um, invite our participants to ask questions. If you have any questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat or the question box. I'm gonna remind you that this webinar will be recorded and posted, so you can look for it. The, the link is in the chat box but it will be um, posted at openchannels.org slash webinar. So you can go there if you didn't get a chance to hear the whole thing or if you want to take a closer look at some of the amazing graphics in here. I think one of the things that I come away with is just how much information is in this report, even for those of us who have looked at it, um, and, and how much um, you know, depth of, of information on a wide range of topics is there to, to look at more closely. So. Um, just inviting you all, if you have questions, please go ahead and, and send those in. I see actually, it does look like there's a question here. No, that's just a, a logistical one. So before we do that, um, I will turn it back over to our speakers for a minute and just ask, is there anything else that you would like to say just in terms of general comments or, um, or wrap up remarks? This is Shellen. I'd just like to echo something that Billy said, um, where he said, you know, climate change isn't a future problem. Climate change and its implications are happening right now. And, um, you know, I tried to show that by showing some of the physical and chemical data from the ocean and showing some of the implications of the events that we talked about, um, that, you know, press perturbations like acidification and deoxygenation. And so I think that was really, at least at the, the meeting that I attended for this report in Monaco last year in September, the clearance meeting, that was really seemed to be felt by the community. And it would be good to convey that. Yes, thank you for that. Okay, I am seeing some questions here. Um, one from Elizabeth McLean, what can we learn from the recent drop in CO2 emissions during the current pandemic regarding benefits and associated trade-offs. This is Shannon again. I'll start, I'll start with that. Um, so I, I know that uh, NOAA is currently working on ways to kind of take, take advantage of this natural experiment and understand um, what is happening with emissions and, and how ecosystems and the earth systems respond to, to lower emission levels. But as I understand it, it's um, you know, on the order of maybe a, a five to 8% decrease in emissions um, that's projected uh, based on what's happened over the past couple of months. So when you think about it, um, while it is one of the largest drops um, that we've experienced since you know, mid-century, mid-last century, um, it, it isn't, um, it isn't huge. And maybe Co would have some insights in that. Yeah, I think I'll just add to that. I mean, we've, um, we've kind of geared up our observations during this period of time. Folks may be aware that NOAA, um, has maintained the longest time series of CO2 emissions since 1958, um, uninterrupted in Mauna Loa. Um, but we have a whole series of different types of observational platforms that we're using now, that's flights or tall towers, flasks on aircraft, to um, gather as much information as we can right now so that um, when things kick up again, we'll have the data that we need in order to do um, any kind of analysis that we think might be useful. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, it's um, 
it's something we've actually, since we're not traveling, we've been able to kind of put that money to more observations. Great. Okay, we have a question. Is there any modeling of water level rise and impacts on inland coastal communities along the Great Lakes? And also the susceptibility of the Great Lakes to warming and productivity issues related to that. Uh, hi, this is Billy Sweet. Yeah, we do measure water levels in the Great Lakes. It's there for navigation reasons, and we do measure changes. Uh, obviously, there's not a sea level rise signal. It's it's definitely a different signal. Um, it's land use as well as runoff in the hydrologic cycle. Um, so that is it kind of lends itself a little bit outside of, of this sea level rise kind of discussion. Though in terms of higher lake levels that are occurring now and, and the risks of erosion and flooding from them are, are definitely of concern and would appear no different than other areas being affected by sea level rise related flooding. Uh, and that is something that NOAA is aware of and, and anticipates bolstering its product set to better address and provide predictive capabilities uh, for these communities. Thanks. I have a question here from Robin Craig. Um, and Shalyn, you touched on this in terms of ecosystem impacts. Um, Robin asks, does the IPCC report consider threshold crossings and potential transformations of processes and ecosystems that are unlikely to be reversed? Yeah, it absolutely does. And I hesitate to, to point to specific examples because I believe there are so many. Um, my emphasis on marine heat waves uh, was kind of a, a call out to that where these types of events can really change ecosystems. For example, the, the kelp forest example that I brought up. But um, yeah, I encourage um, the individual who asked the question to take a hard look at chapter five where a number of those things are discussed. And I'm guessing also um, in, the, in the polar chapter as well, yeah. That's that's correct. Uh, the chapter does deal with it. Uh, the thresholds are less well known and harder to predict on uh, ocean acidification. Of course, the research is coming forward on that that's uh, helping us considerably. And there are a lot of laboratory studies happening within National Marine Fisheries Service looking at thermal tolerances. And so those thresholds are are certainly a, a focus of interest. Uh, the irreversibility of them is harder to uh, understand. Uh, if you lose whole scale ecosystems, you know, as I showed you in the retreat of the Arctic system and, and the advance of the boreal system, it will take much longer to recover. And so we're quite interested in looking at those. So we have several more questions, but we really only have time for one. So I will just ask, um, how is this report received by Congress, federal agencies, and other decision makers? Uh, maybe I'll take a stab at that one. This is Co. Uh, so uh, with regard to Congress, uh, the Senate Task Force uh, for Climate Change asked for a briefing on this report, as they have for um, the 1.5 report. Um, that task force is very, very focused on ocean issues so and very knowledgeable, I'll say. I, I, I gave them that briefing and was very impressed with their deep knowledge of ocean syndication um, and um, issues in the Gulf of Maine, et cetera. Um, I, just taken together, the three special reports from this cycle have had more media hits by far than any reports that we've released over our 30 year history. And, you know, this report was a bit challenging to convey in a communications way because any communication expert would tell you, make sure you've got some solutions, make sure you've got some positive message. And this one was um, really um, a lot of doom and gloom of impacts. Um, but still, uh, I think it just taken together with the other reports, it kind of spurs the need for um, um, increased action. Great. Well, thank you. I, I just want to thank all our speakers for doing such a great job and laying out this incredibly important uh, landmark report and encouraging folks to go and learn more about um, all the information in there. Uh, there were a few questions that we didn't get to. We will make sure to pass those on to our speakers. And uh, if they're able to get back to you, um, 
you'll they'll have that opportunity. And meanwhile, I really encourage you to um, share the recording and take another look at the report. And uh, thanks very much again to all of our speakers and to all of you who joined us. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.